So I've known Lee since 1956 when we were high school students in Montana. We got together partly through Caltech, partly through uh, the late Ernst Eichwald who had a lab in a private hospital in Montana. We uh, are extremely close, our families are close. We've owned property and lived in property together, written textbooks together, and uh, done a lot of science together. The one thing I'll say about Lee is that he does think 20 years in the future. And that's good and it's bad. The good is, of course, what you see here. The bad I'll talk about later. Okay, I'm going to talk about stem cells. This little tiny thing is a blood-forming stem cell, which we isolated in mice in 1988, humans in 1991, and have taken into clinical practice. But the important point about stem cell biology, the only important point, is that stem cells, when they divide to give rise to new daughter cells, on average, one of the two is still a stem cell. That's it. None of the other daughter cells, with the possible exception of memory T and memory B cells, which I think are stem cells of the lymphoid system, have the property of self-renewal. So you can take all of the cells here and transplant them if they're below the stem cell and everything will be gone in eight weeks. You just transplant the one in 100,000 cells in the blood-forming tissue, the stem cell, and it regenerates for the lifetime of at least four serial transplanted hosts. So it tells you it's important. And I want to say to all of those people who are doing single cell sequencing for an atlas, you'll never get that. You'll never see it and you won't know what it is if you see it. You'll get all the mature cells. So you have to invest in stem cell biology as well as mindless sequencing. <laughs> now, <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> uh, years ago at a company I co-founded called Systemics, Lee was a co-founder, uh, Mike McCune, uh, Dave Baltimore and I, uh, we found out we could isolate in pure form human blood forming stem cells. The starting material, either bone marrow or what's called mobilized blood, if it's taken from a cancer patient, for example, with metastatic breast cancer, they almost always have cancer cells in it. If you take it from a donor to transplant a host, the mobilized blood of the bone marrow always has T cells in it, which cause graft-versus-host disease, which unbelievably still is the major problem in allo transplants. So we wanted to test if we purified the stem cells, could we use them in transplantation in humans? We knew that we were 250,000 fold depleted from any spiked cancer we put in or T cells. So we get virtually pure populations of stem cells and my wife Ann and I were in the room when the first patient on earth to get pure stem cells, a woman with metastatic breast cancer, that the team told me it was too bad. She was the one that was the first patient because she had a pleural effusion of cancer. First patient, we give a thimble full of clear looking liquid after she had a lethal dose, combination dose of these drugs. She's alive today. She taught 20 years of high school, I mean, of, of uh, elementary school, raised her kids. Because we found that if you rescue somebody from that high-dose chemotherapy with purified stem cells rather than cancer-contaminated cells, you change the outcome. This is the overall survival from the cancer-contaminated mobilized blood. It's no different than drugs. It's no different than palliative intent chemotherapy. It's the overall survival. This is the Stanford cohort of cancer-free stem cells, same patients, same docs, not prospectively randomized. Half of the mobilized blood patients were dead at 25 months, 
half of these at 10 years. So on average, those who maybe didn't make it still lived eight years longer with their families and everything. And one third are alive today. I talked to two of them in this last year. And when I say metastatic, bony metastases, lung metastases, liver. But at this point, the company that the large pharma that purchased Systemics, the company we co-founded, shut it down when they got an orally available drug that makes them a couple to three billion dollars a year. Which reminds all of us that although we think we do science to advance medicine for people, every company on earth that is a company is responsible to its shareholders to make a profit. Now you can mix it up a bit, but if you don't have that clearly in mind, you'll miss the point. And that's what causes, in part, I think, the valley of death and why we don't really get there. I've been trying for years to do this again. Finally, I got the cells back, and now um, we are raising the money at Stanford to redo the experiment. Now, I'm going to talk about stem cell competition and the development of leukemia as an example because it's very important how this revealed to us what were the important points. So this is supposed to be the stem cells. This is the blood they make, so it's a little different than I showed in the first slide. Mutations like these that lead to cancer, of course, occur randomly. And if you get one in any of these other cells, any of the mutations we've looked at that are leukemogenic, they don't change a non-self-renewing cell into a self-renewing cell. So that tells us right away that the only one that's relevant is the stem cell because it doesn't have to cause self-renewal, it's already in a self-renewing cell. I also forgot to tell you that we know by direct observations of stem cells within the bone marrow that they have a defined niche and only a hundred of them in a mouse femur. And that doesn't change no matter what you do so far. So you're always competing for the niche. We found that even the first mutation, this is a hypothesis slide, even the first mutation leads to the expansion of these cells at the expense of the normal stem cells. So years later, Ravi Majetti, Steve Quake, and I took leukemia patients found their exome mutations, made DNA primers from them, and asked, do we see, if not seven mutations, a cell with six, and is that at the stem cell or at the leukemia stem cell stage? We defined in humans that the leukemia stem cell stage was the next step down multipotent progenitor, which at the single cell level can make all blood cells but can't self-renew normally but the leukemia that escapes is at that stage, not the stem cell stage. So now we want to see is there N minus one, N minus two, and so on. There's the actual experiment that we did, the people who did it. Exome sequence of AML, we also sequenced the T cells, so we would look at somatic mutations within the patient rather than allelic variations between people. This is patient number 70 at Stanford. I don't know this person's name or sex. These are the mutations we saw that were exome. I put in red those that are known genes that are involved in leukemia, one patient after another. And this is stop codons, stop codons, change of sequence, internal tendon repeat so that a receptor now signals without the ligand. And once we got those and made DNA primers for all of these mutations, we took single blood-forming stem cells. So we did single stuff that we actually published in 2012 to get the order of mutations. Here's patient 70. The first mutation, without any doubt, that was in the lineage that gave rise to cancer, the leukemia, was a loss of function TET2. And in both this patient and this patient, the second one, not by intent, I don't think by communication, in the same cell, the other allele, loss of function. The fact that we could find it mean it had expanded. 
The fact that we could stick a needle in any bone marrow meant it migrated just like normal blood-forming stem cells migrate specifically with known homing receptors. So the science does mean something. CTCF, that's part of the transcription apparatus. The mutation changed the DNA binding site. So that changed what is going to be opened or closed or transcribed in the particular cell. It happens over and over and over again. And then at the end, all of my hematology friends told me FLT3 internal tendon repeat would be the first and everything would follow. It's always the last. And it's not detectable in the stem cell but in that next downstream cell. Here's a summary of 21 straight leukemias that Ravi Majetti and Ryan uh, and I did. And what you can see is that the first mutations, I didn't show you the TET2 here, but this is the frequency of mutations, are the uh, DNMT3, IDH12. Those are all in genes that define the epigenome. And now you have misregulation, either opening up or closing chromatin for gene expression. That's the basis for this finally hitting a few mutations that may expand the pool and compete with the normal blood-forming stem cells. And as I said here, the last mutations, RAS, beta-catenin, MYC, and um, I think MYC, and... Um, FLT3, that receptor, are in the downstream cell. It could be in the stem cell, but the downstream cell proliferates so much, you just, that's what you see. So that's a lesson for us. And the lesson, I think, is general. In acute myelogenous leukemia, progression is in a blood stem cell clone. The leukemia stem cell is at a downstream progenitor stage, and the pre-leukemic clones of stem cells compete with normal stem cells. There are no leukemias that we've ever found in humans or mice of blood-forming stem cells. So whatever that niche is, virtual or real, it controls cell numbers dramatically, and it means we got to understand how the niche works. This is where this is. I can say this at a hood symposium without getting laughed at. I say this at a standard medical school, they start saying, well, they get pissed off. It's probably true for every cancer because every cancer occurs in a tissue that has stem cells. The names of the mutations are similar. They don't change non-self-renewing daughter cells into self-renewing cells, so I predict that it will occur in all tissues. But here is an emerging field, I think, that will be extremely important in the next 10, 15 years. The clonal competition by precancerous stem cells can lead to diseases themselves that are caused by the mutations or an epigenetic change in the dominant clone. So just to reemphasize, the mutations are random. All kinds of cells get mutations, but only the stem cells carry them forward in a clone that can collect more than one. Stem cells compete for the niche. Dominant stem cells may have differentiation or survival defects. I'm going to talk a little later about a proven human pathology where almost every blood-forming stem cell comes from a single cell that had a mutation. And it's been found now by my former grad student, Sid J. Swell and Ben Ebert, that in this room, people over 40 we'll have about a 15% chance of having the beginning of that. And you look in their blood, they have clonal hematopoiesis. And I want you to think about, if you can get clonal hematopoiesis causing a blood disease, what if you have clonal hematopoiesis in a neural stem cell, or a gut stem cell, or a lung stem cell? What does that lead to in terms of disease? Because you would have thought with all the stem cells, blood-forming stem cells we have, it couldn't be an acquired disease that is inherent in stem cells. And my set point is, if you compete for niches, a single cell can take over the whole 
tissue forming apparatus. At least I think so. So many years ago, Tanisha Jure, Sean Morris, and Mike Clark and I reproposed that there would be cancer stem cells in the context of knowing about stem cells and cancer stem cells. And the main point is that if you get rid of all the other cells, but you don't get rid of the cancer stem cell, the cancer regrows. Almost all of the 20th century advances in chemotherapy came looking at cell lines where you got maybe 90% of the tumor got away. And resistance to radiation, resistance to DNA damaging agents, resistant to hydrophobic molecules is inherent in all the stem cells we've looked at transport, repair, glutathione, synthetase, so on. So we think that although empirically it has saved many of our lives, it's at a cost. And so we want to be able to get at what might be particular about stem cells. When David Traver and I and then Sid Jaswell Ravi and I looked at pure leukemia stem cells from humans and pure multipotent progenitors or poor hematopoietic stem cells from normal people, amongst the many genes that we found with Lee and his team was CD47. CD47, as far as I could tell, was just another immunology term. In fact, Pip Americ told me it was just another immunology term. But Oldenburg and Lindbergh had done a beautiful experiment knocking out in mice and looking at their red cell, and the red cell lifespan went from two and a half weeks to two hours by transfusion testing into wild-type animals. And what it occurs is that CD47 is the ligand for a macrophage receptor called signal-inducing receptor protein alpha, which has an item motif that activates SHIP1 and or SHIP2 phosphatases, tyrosine phosphatases, and that paralyzes the cell by dephosphorylating at least the actin, myosin, paxillin skeleton, temporarily paralyzed. And we propose that if that don't eat me signal is there, it must be countering an eat me signal, which actually uh, Eric Lagasse and I showed in 1994 the program cell removal eat me signals for macrophages was not blocked by BCL2 when apoptosis was blocked. So you would have living cells, but it didn't change their number in the body because this was just as good program cell removal at homeostatic regulation as apoptosis. And you've heard the many, many ways that cells die. I'll bet you haven't heard this point. Program cell removal can do it by itself. So it might be important. So CD47 is a candidate. CD47, in fact, is on every human cancer that we've looked at. We developed a blocking antibody to CD47. Here's just one case we tested. So this is a breast cancer stem cell that Mike Clark and Fren Sheeran got directly from the patient, isolated the 44 plus 24 minus cells, put them into the mammary gland of an immune deficient mouse, waited a few weeks and then treated with an immunoglobin controller, the blocking antibody 47, and it worked, and it works in glioblastoma, and in fact, in its preclinical development, we found it's in all human cancers. So by that assay, human to mouse, it is a dominant don't eat me signal, okay? And in our treatments, it's always easier to treat small tumors than big tumors, so surgical or radiotherapeutic debulking is still critical, and chemotherapy may be prior, to get a patient so they could be treated by this. This is not like a multiplying T cell system that you release. This is the macrophages that are there at the time you block the 47. It's the dominant one, but others do exist. I'll talk about the responses we've seen clinically, and my disclaimer is that against my will, the university said we're going to license it to somebody if you want to be in on it, try. My university. We were funded by the California Institute of Regenerative Medicine and the Ludwig Foundation, and I wanted to keep it there 
so that it wouldn't happen like the hematopoietic stem cell transplant in breast cancer patients that you made a success, but nobody did it. But they decided, you university presidents or medical school deans can think about that issue when you want to get your money out fast, no matter who did it. Okay, so what's the eat me signal? We were lucky to find, because my daughter Rachel Googled eat me, that's something more than I knew how to do at the time, and it came out calreticulin. Now, calreticulin is an ER resonant protein. It doesn't have a transmembrane signal. It has a KDEL uh, receptor that keeps it in the endoplasmic reticulum. So when we found that it was on the cell surface of tumor cells, all tumor cells we took from in vivo, it was kind of amazing. So it was the eat me signal that overcame it. Now I'm going to summarize a ton of work by saying the calreticulin doesn't have to be made by the tumor and usually isn't made by the tumor to be put on its own surface. You activate toll-like receptors. We tested three, four, and seven. Ming gave Feng, Chris Margin, Den and Wang and I. And um, the activated toll-like receptor phosphorylates Bruton's tyrosine kinase and in, in the brutinib sensitive step, BTK phosphorylates ER calreticulin and unknown protease cleaves between the retention signal and now it's released. And this is very likely to be similar to the mutations that lead calreticulin to be a, an equal partner in causing myeloproliferative neoplasms with uh, the JAK2 kinase mutation. That's an aside, sorry. So that the macrophages make, and now because it's cleaved, secrete calreticulin. And tumor cells, but not normal cells, decorate themselves with it. CD91 on macrophages is the receptor for calreticulin bound to the cell, and it eats the cells. So this is kind of an amazing and surprising one. And in the tumors that um, Chris Marjan and, and Ming Feng and I looked at, if we CRISPR knocked out any of the silyl transferases, it didn't really cause it. But if you knocked out neuraminidase 4, they went back to sialo rather than acyaloglycans on the surface. So this is an acyaloglycan. It is created in the tumor cells, and I'm going to argue almost all other dangerous cells that trigger an SOS or a suicide or other response to get rid of it. And that it is also the signal that ends the lifespan of red cells, neutrophils, and so on. So I'm being a little general, but that's what Lee asked me to be. Okay, it's a common eat me signal in granocytes, cancer cells, and we found it in dysplastic smooth muscle cells and atherosclerosis, every patient. And Russell Ross would be happy to know that we found each of those atherosclerotic lesions are clonal expansions, pre-tumorous expansions, you would say, of the smooth muscles in the blood vessel. They're bumps in the blood vessel, not all of your smooth muscle cells closing off the vessel. Should have been a clue right from the beginning. Russell thought of it, so did I. And um, the receptors in the acyaloglycan, what is the signal that releases neuraminidase or other molecules? We don't know yet, but that's obviously future science. It's going to be uh, perhaps important. And um, I'll just go to myelodysplastic syndrome uh, next, I hope. Yes. Wendy Pang, John Pluvenage, Chris Park and I published several years ago that in every patient we see with myelodysplastic syndrome. Now, myelodysplastic syndrome is a disease, disease of people my age. They either don't have enough platelets or red cells or neutrophils or some combination. The odd thing about that is that almost any of the lesions, mutation in ribosome binding proteins, monosomy 7, monosomy 8, 5Q minus, any of those end up in the same 
disease. And so it hints at the same mechanism. And what we showed is that 98% or greater of the pre-leukemic, we'll call them hematopoietic stem cells or phenotypic stem cells, came from a single cell. Every patient so far. If they're such strong stem cells, why do they have a disease? Here's why. The granocyte monocyte progenitor in those that have neutropenia, the megakaryocyte progenitor in those that have thrombocytopenia, the erythroid progenitor in those that have anemia, those progenitors put calreticulin on the surface, the distress signal is there, and they're eaten. So we think that's the mechanism of the disease. So MDSHC <laughs> blood forming stem cells dominate niches, but they really can't make blood. Increased CD47 expression occurs when MDS switches to acute myelogenous leukemia. So that's going forward. Um, so this is again saying, can a single other stem cell also cause a brain disease or a fibroblast, fibrotic disease, smooth muscle, and so on. In fact, we've shown it. At least in mouse models and in looking at the pathology of human fibrotic disease, Gerlinda Wernick and I have shown, published, and it's completely ignored, of course. That's what happens when you publish things like this. In pulmonary fibrosis in humans and mice, in scleroderma, non-alcoholic uh, hepatosis, renal fibrosis, and ICD-47 is therapeutic in the mouse models of those diseases. Nick Leeper, Yoko Kojima, and I showed, as I just mentioned, that oxid oxidized, oxidated LDL damages arterial smooth muscle cells or their progenitors. You get a clone that proliferates, and now it expresses calreticulin and CD47. And in the mouse model of APOE knockout, high fat diet, I like to say my diet, not Lee's diet. Lee's always tried to be healthy. Um, they express CD47, and you can prevent the development of atherosclerotic lesions with anti CD47 alone in the mouse. So I'll keep saying in the mouse because when you get to humans, things change. And we have a paper now just coming out in Science Translational Medicine where Jonathan Tsai, you, Yuval Renkovich, and I have shown that you can induce peritoneal adhesions, a very big problem in surgery and medicine, and the cells that give rise to the adhesions are mesothelial cells, which we showed are the precursors of intra-abdominal and thoracic organ smooth muscle, and fibroblasts, they are responsible, the mesothelial cells, for making the smooth muscle that turns an incipient blood vessel in an embryonic or fetal mouse into an arterial rather than venous. We published that. Um, and coming out is when we induce those adhesions, anti-mesothelin and anti-CD47, get rid of an already established peritoneal adhesion that glommed up the whole peritoneal cavity. Now, I'm going to go back to the leukemia and simply to say, once you know that a blocking antibody the don't eat me signal can help get phagocytosis, then you could rethink that maybe drugs like rituximab are giving a prophagocytic signal. Now, if you ask an oncologist how it works, they'll say, oh, ADCC, antibody-dependent cell-mediated killing NK cells. But our antibodies work in mice that have no NK cells. They have a lot of macrophages, which have exactly the same FC receptor that's prophagocytic, okay? So here's non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. This is a diffuse large B cell lymphoma that was actually partially resistant to rituximab. We transplanted it into mice, and this is its growth rate. Our antibody makes stasis but didn't get rid of them. They're pretty large, aggressive tumors. Rituximab helped a bit, but together they cured, at least in mice, significant amount. Ranjana Advani, not associated with us, led a clinical trial from my company, 47 Inc., 
where we gave those, that combination of anti-CD47 and rituximab to patients who respond, did not respond to our CHOP on the last round, rituximab plus the drugs. Nearly 50% of DLBCL and follicular lymphoma responded, and 80% roughly of those are still complete responders. So the question comes up, you cured all of the lymphomas in mice, but you only get maybe 40% in humans. And so this is where it's extremely critical that those involved with the clinical trials, those involved in the companies that do the clinical trials, pay attention not to just the responders, but the non-responders and saying, what's going on? Same with trastuzumab, Herceptin, and HER2-positive breast cancer. We discovered in the last year two more don't eat me signals. PDL1, which Roger might mention later, on tumors is the ligand for PD1, which is on exhausted T cells, and we showed in the tumors we looked at, all of them we looked at, they turn on PD1. I don't know how they do, but it's a don't eat me signal in that situation, as Sidney Gordon, uh, Aaron Ringroy Motor, and I showed, and beta 2 microglobulin, MHC class 1, interacting with LIR, LRB is another. So there are plenty of ones to examine to increase the frequency hopefully, of this disease. And I'll just mention, and Roger might address it because we talked about it last night, is do we really know how anti-PD-1 and anti-PDL-1 work in patients? Are we really looking for exhausted killer T cells that kill the tumor cells in the patient? We should, and so on. Now, I want to hit one last thing in the minute I have left to say that I'm not giving up on hematopoietic stem cell transplant. I got the antibodies to do it. We have it at Stanford. It's in a not-for-profit setting. When you transplant from donor to host, the T cells that are in the graft cause anti-leukemia, anti-lymphoma, and graft-versus-host disease. And nobody is bothered to figure out how to separate those activities, even though we know a lot about the T cell receptors and should be able to figure it out sometime. But we know already, and we've proven in mice and in what's called skid mice, that if you don't have T cells in it, you can engraft, and there's no graft versus host disease at all. The problem for many of the diseases that we want to treat, that is regenerative medicine, where you don't need T cells to kill a tumor, is the radiation is way too dangerous for old and young. So, well, I'm going to skip that and say that we found, Anish Kachekovitz, Dita Bhattacharya and I, that in immune deficient mice, probably ones that have the Omen syndrome, that if you just get rid of stem cells with an anti-CKID antibody, you can increase the level. We have a clinical trial going on now at Stanford in human skid patients with an Amgen antibody and we have, I can report on three, but probably four in a row transplants where the only conditioning was that antibody. Anishka did three times in a row just to see how far she could go, and you can get up to 80 to 90% donor cells. But it didn't work in immune competent animals, so we added a number of antibodies together, anti-C kit, anti-T cell antibodies, and if we add to that anti-CD47, and you gotta add it to it as a more eat me saying, I got it. You engraft all of them, and as Benson George and I have shown, you can do what's called a haplotransplant, and if you transplant a heart from the stem cell donor, the heart is accepted and they survive, but a third party heart is rejected. So, we think of the future the near future is that for those non-cancer patients, sickle cell, beta thal, type 1 diabetes, lupus, multiple sclerosis, not rare diseases, that we're going to shift from radiation and cytotoxic drugs to antibody conditioning, and we're going to co-transplant tissue stem cells like a 
brain stem cell and blood forming stem cell to induce tolerance. That's what I showed in the last slide. And hopefully, in the far future, in people funded by almost anybody but the federal government in this administration, you could get those cells, hopefully, from embryonic stem cells or iPS cells rather than somebody who was shot or died in a car accident or Honda. Thank you. <laughs>